you know, countries are actively looking, seeking alternatives. And so you've been hearing more and more about uh, potential BRICS currency uh, backed in gold. Um, you know, you've been hearing uh, Zimbabwe that established, uh, they, there was talk about them establishing, and I believe have taken steps towards uh, establishing a, a gold backed currency. Um, so, and I think more and more you're going to see this as confidence in the dollar continues to drop, as countries have been watching from afar the United States help their friends and hurt their enemies by use and by weaponization of the global reserve currency. And now they're saying, hey, wait a second. This doesn't make sense. It doesn't as as a question of game theory, as a question of like just uh, just geopolitical um, just general thought process. It doesn't make sense to have one party that can put their finger on the scale the way the United States can, especially when they've shown their propensity and their willingness to do this so often. Hey guys, my name is Danny, and you're watching Capital Cosm. Today I have JP Cortez making his maiden voyage on the show. JP, thank you so much for coming on, my friend. Danny, thank you for having me, man. It's great to be on. For sure, for sure. Well, let's just dive right in, JP. Um, for people who may be coming across your work for the first time, uh, who are you? Uh, what, what, what is kind of like your origin story? What got you into sound money? Um, and then what is the sound money defense league that you work with? So I, like you mentioned, I am the executive director of the Sound Money Defense League. Uh, the Sound Money Defense League is a nationwide public policy group uh, advocating for the remonetization of gold and silver uh, as constitutional sound money. Um, you know, we believe that one of the primary reasons, perhaps the primary reason why gold and silver are not used as money today is the friction that taxes imposed on the metals creates. You can't really use gold and silver as money today because in some states you're charged a sales tax when you buy gold and silver. And in most states and on the federal level, you're charged a capital gains tax if you ever use or sell your gold and silver. So functionally, it's not capable right now. It, it's, um, its capacity, its capability as a potential money is being uh, suffocated by taxes and other regulations. And so we're going state to state, uh, removing these disincentives, removing the roadblocks of people standing in the way of using gold and silver as money and smart entrepreneurs innovating within gold and silver as money. Um, so this is actually our 10th year anniversary. So we've been doing this now 10 years and it has been fantastic. You know, I came out of college and started doing this. I graduated from Auburn University where I studied at the Mises Institute for a long time. And I, I sort of started, uh, I, I became very impassioned with, with the idea of sound money because it, it's, it's import became instantly clear to me. Right. Sound money defined as a money that retains its purchasing power over over time while being tested by market forces. Right. This isn't a money by decree. It's not a money by executive order, but rather it's money because markets tell us that it makes good money. And the the benefits that sound money provides are, are two really important ones, as far as I can see. Um, the, the first is that it allows individuals and groups to make long-term investments. You know, being able to rely on a stable, trusted money over the course of years, decades, centuries is so important to being able to plan infrastructure and growth. And these are the things that, you know, create uh, human enrichment. These are the things that improve living standards. These are the things that allow people to live longer, fuller, and healthier lives. And a sound money is a, a necessary condition of that. The second important part of sound money that um, that that I was sort of uh, impassioned with was the idea that sound money acts as a defense against a government that might otherwise recklessly spend. Uh, you know, today America has been fighting wars of choice around the globe for decades, uh, and you know this is something that we're actively doing. And with with little recourse and with little uh, permission or consent from the people being taxed, who people who are having cities uh, bombed in their names uh, without their permission. So, you know, this is not just a question of theoretical supply and demand graphs or, you know, uh, sort of the very esoteric economics. There is a real human morality to governments who have shown their propensity for war being able to constrict them and disallowing their ability to fund and fight these wars is a moral imperative. Uh, and that is why sound money is important. You know, for those two, I think, 
really important reasons. Um, so to that end, we've been doing this now 10 years. Uh, and I'm actually happy to say that this has been our most successful year yet, as far as successful legislative projects on the state level in DC, the recognition, and just the general revival of sound money as a dinnertime conversation, as a as as a real potential alternative to the current monetary system that we have today that's being eaten, ravaged by inflation. And it's not sustainable for so many American families. Yeah, it, it appears sound money, the concept of sound money tends to really resonate with libertarians and you know some sec- some some segments on the right. Have you seen any success with uh, reaching out with folks on the on the left side of the aisle? One of the things that I've been really excited about that I've found is that sound money is nonpartisan. This issue of sound money is 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 not based on party affiliation. Just for example, New Jersey is one of the highest tax states in the country, you know, known infamous even for having among the highest tax rates in the entire country. But just a few weeks ago, Governor Murphy in New Jersey signed a bill into law that ended all taxes, all sales taxes on the purchase of gold and silver. This is a bill that worked its way through the legislature without a single no vote. That was more than 40 votes in the Senate, more than uh, or almost 80 votes in the New Jersey State Assembly. And every single one of these politicians, most of them a very blue controlled, a very Democrat heavy legislature, every single one of them voted yes on removing taxes, removing disincentives to acquiring and using gold and silver. And I think that's because it's no longer deniable. You know, for a long time, maybe in the earlier stages of the COVID years, at first we were told, of course, there would be no inflation. You know, Jen Psaki was going up and giving these press releases, these press conferences every day, talking about how every economist they'd spoken to assured us that there would be no inflation. And then, of course, you might remember the the era of it's transitory. This is just transitory. It will pass. Worry not. And of course, since then, there have been several other explanations, excuses, uh, misdirections as to as to the root cause of the inflation. Of course, we've heard that this is now Putin's fault. Um, That is the, the, the Russian aggression in Ukraine that has now caused these higher prices. Of course, we've seen Elizabeth Warren and her lackeys point the finger at your grocery store CEO. The people that are providing groceries to you are, are price gouging. Greedflation is the term, the, the little kitschy term that they're using to describe this phenomenon. But of course, we know people who have who have studied uh, money, who have studied economics, and even people who haven't, people who understand the basic idea of dilution, people understand that if you have wine and you add water to it, you'll have less wine. People who understand that, wait, we've printed millions of billions of dollars throughout the the throughout the the government uh reaction to the covid virus and then now throughout what is an escalation of war that we've seen probably more in in several decades america is printing money left and right the the money printer go burr and it's showing no signs of stopping and so when when the government the federal government and the federal reserve talk about how you know the maybe the cause for inflation is this it's the the rich ceos it's it's people being greedy it's uh, you know whatever it is all of those all of them are misdirections and every single one of them is an attempt to obfuscate the actual person institution responsible for the inflation that is keeping american families from many be- ever being able to afford a home from many cases people struggling to afford food or vehicles or uh, transportation or medicine or other basic necessities energy being another one you know this isn't an act of god this doesn't happen by accident inflation is is a policy choice and so uh, like i mentioned earlier there there is an a moral imperative to vocally stand up against these policies that are actively hurting the poorest people among us. Yeah, and when when you when you when you're in in this fight, what has been your biggest obstacle and then what do you see as your biggest obstacle moving forward? Honestly, more times than not, the fight is a lack of any sort of knowledge at all. Um, I've said before, there are here in the United States, there are more than 8,000 elected state legislators between all 50 states, 
all of their legislate all of their legislatures, except for in the case of Nebraska, who is a unicameral legislature. Uh, the rest of the states have, you know, two chambers. You've got your Senate and your House or your Assembly. And in many cases, in some cases, it's more than 150 elected state legislatures in each one of these states. And the truth is, the vast majority of these elected legislators have never heard the term sound money. They've never thought about money any deeper than, oh, these are just paper bills and this is what the government tells me money is, without any conception of, wait, where is money? Why do we, or, or where does our money derive its value? Why do we use money? Is the US dollar the best potential monetary unit for us to be using? You know, these are questions that people don't ask themselves. And so as far as what we're doing uh, on the policy side, a big part of this has been education. You know, while passing legislation is great, you know, we we worked on eight successful legislative projects this year across seven states. Uh, last year, it was, I think, six states that had passed legislation. The year before that, it was five. So there's been a steady increase of the, the passage of pro gold and silver public policy uh, at the state level over the last couple of years. But maybe more important than than the passing legislation is using being able to use the Sound Money Defense League as a as a microphone for these topics that are uh, often not considered at all. And when they are considered, what you're seeing now more, especially in the younger demographics, is more of a left-leaning Marxist understanding, or, or rather Marxist conception, I should say, of, of what money is and where value is, and or where value is derived from and what people are entitled to, um, which is a, a very different approach from the, the Austrian sort of conception of, of money um, and economics. Um, so I, I think a, a big part of it has been educating people for the first time who have never even thought to ask these questions. Uh, after that, it's probably tax hungry politicians. You know, the, they see uh, any, any, any industry really as a potential cash cow. And if you tax it, uh, then, you know, you're talking about increasing or uh, bolstering the coffers of any given state. Um, and so they see gold and silver as taxable items. You know, they see dollar signs. They see potential tax revenue. Um, what they fail to understand uh, is that gold and silver, a tax on gold and silver especially, is such an inefficient form of tax collection that it doesn't even make sense, right? In many cases, there are only five states in the country left that charge a sales tax on precious metals. So if I was in one of those five states, I would just go online and order my metals online. Or I would drive to one of the neighboring states because all of, of the five states remaining that still charge tax, they're all five completely surrounded by states that have already exempted the tax. So I would drive an hour to the nearest border, get my medals there, and just drive them across the border and avoid the tax. And the thing about that is that the, the dealers are losing out on tax revenue because you know your, your coin flips, um, your ping tests, any sort of other taxable item is being lost because consumers are going out of state, you know? So like it, it actively harms dealers. It actively harms people who are into gold and silver who are wanting to buy or invest or, or save in gold and silver. Um, and it, it's a, what the state sees as a potential fiscal boon to the state. But if, if you look at it dynamically at all, it doesn't make any sense to be taxing gold and silver. And I would even go as far as to say that the reason that they're taxing gold and silver is not just because of the tax revenue, but because they're trying to trap you into using the dollar. Mm -hmm. You know, no one no one woke up this morning and said, I want to use the dollar because its monetary properties are what I want my money to be. I this this the US dollar is my ideal form of what is deliverable and transferable and stable. And all of these properties that you want a good money to have. No one said, hey, the U.S. dollar checks all these boxes. The reality is that in 1933, gold and silver was outlawed. The, by executive order, the, the, the U.S. confiscated gold and silver. And now we're seeing that all. The, and then, of course, in 1971, Nixon closing the gold window, officially severing any tie to gold and the U.S. dollar. And since then, it has been an onslaught on, against people who want to own precious metals. You're talking about the IRS unilaterally deciding that gold and silver are collectibles. And so they're subject to a discriminatorily high 28% capital gains rate, you know, the way you would tax uh, Beanie Babies or, or precious art. 
And then you have states taxing the purchase of precious metals, you know, sales tax when you buy them. The truth is that there is there has been a an onslaught, a an intentional uh playing of defense against gold and silver as money. And so to remove all of the briar and all of the brush standing in the way of people using gold and silver as money, I think is among, you know, it's the most effective thing that I believe that I can be doing personally to restore gold and silver and to restore some sanity back into this monetary system. So I, I want to hark on the point of education a, a little bit more. You know, we all have friends, family, whoever, who actually they listen to the talking points in the news and they do believe that this inflation was caused by Putin or by just greedy grocery store owners and things of that nature. And it's very convincing because people people search for a for a scapegoat. How do you how, more specifically, how do you penetrate through that narrative? How how can how for, for people who have friends like this, who have family members like this, who do believe this stuff, how do you actually allow them to conceptualize the uh, you know, the capacity of, 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 of sound money and uh, the consequences that flow from it and the consequences that flow from fiat money, which is what we've seen with this inflation? It helps a lot that the administration's own Federal Reserve research teams have come out against greedflation as a a um, a plausible reason or explanation for the inflation that we've seen. The the San Francisco Federal Reserve uh, they put out a research paper saying that this is not the case that that CEOs that grocery stores are operating on razor thin margins and it's not the case that their margins now are any bigger than they were pre COVID times. But you know. That is sort of a, a very kind of esoteric, oh, look at the charts, look at the numbers. Yeah. And frankly, I don't think that that's something that necessarily resonates with people. Um, another argument that I might be willing to bring up to, to someone like this is, is to really examine what that means about inflation, or rather what it means about greedflation. Is, is the argument then that pre-2020, that CEOs and that grocery store owners were particularly kind? Is it that, you know, it wasn't until 2020 that they uh, woke up one morning and suddenly decided, ah, I know, let's be let's all uh, entirely be be selfish and greedy today. And furthermore, when prices fall, does this mean that CEOs are, are met were just stricken with benevolence one day? They woke up and decided today I want to help the poor. Of course not. This isn't how pricing structures work. Right. Um you know, we're seeing right now, and you're in, uh, I believe, in the, the southern-ish half of the United States. You may have experienced a, a hurricane that recently came through that may have had some effect in your area. I know in North Carolina, um, we uh, there are parts of North Carolina that were very heavily affected by this. And one of the things we're talking about that is coming up is like price gouging. How does how do these markets work? How Why is it that water bottles are $10 or that a gallon of gas is $10? How can these selfish, greedy CEOs not see that people are hurting? But you have to kind of understand and scratch a little bit, look into the second level or second order effects here, right? So without pricing mechanisms that adjust in times of pinched supply or in times of increased demand, what you're seeing is shortage. You know, uh, people wouldn't be able to acquire any water or any goods or any medicine if prices didn't adjust. But because of dynamic pricing, because prices do adjust to supply and demand. We're seeing that people, while it may be more expensive, people are, are better able to allocate scarce resources and decide, is this really something I need? Or do I need to buy two of these? Or can I just get by with one? So pricing markets and systems themselves adjust and they they are they are chock full of information. And so when when you go to the grocery store and you say, or rather you go to the grocery store and you notice that, you know, uh, any particular thing, a bushel, a bushel of apples is more expensive today than it was during during the earlier years of COVID. You know, I think it is is totally natural. It's it's sort of uh, very prima facie. It makes sense. Oh, it's the apple person. The apple person is the reason these apples are more expensive. But with with a little bit of understanding of economics, you'll see that that's not the case. It's the dilution of the purchasing power of the money. 
it's a, a slow withering away. And like history shows us this, you know, uh, if we can go back to, to ancient Rome, we can go back to the greatest civilizations of all time. It is the clipping of coins, the dilution of the purchasing power of money. It is the, the siphoning from the private, the, the, the lot of private savings to the government that ultimately causes destruction in, in societal fabric that ultimately causes downturns in economy. Um, and all of these negatively affect society and individuals as people. Yeah. And in addition to that, I want to, again, I want to harken back to uh, an earlier point you made in regards to the, you know, the hegemon and its abuse of the fiat currency. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we see the United States and, you know, as well as its proxies just bombing the shit out of these countries thousands of miles away. And a lot of this is downstream of, you know, the, of the fact that we have, you know, the world reserve currency, um, that's also fiat. We can just print a limitless supply of it. And, you know, there's always going to be demands for demand for dollars around the world. So essentially the world finances the war machine. How how would the how would the US hegemon or just any hegemon in general, whatever, it's just like in a in a in an abstract way, how would a gold standard or some, you know, some non-fiat currency uh, disincentivize uh, this kind of behavior. I think a big part of it is that it's not subject to weaponization the way we're seeing today, right? You you just mentioned you know the U.S. and its proxies actively engaging in warfare uh, in our name or in the name of of proxies actively engaging in it or funding it um, over the world, and this has been the case for for many decades now. And all of this has happened without the consent of the governed. Um, you know, we're seeing right now de-dollarization take place. And that's not because, you know, the U.S. It, it, when I think an important point is that when when the U.S. dollar dies, when it loses its status as a global reserve currency and then ultimately dies, the eulogies for the dollar, the you know, the the, the gravestone for the dollar should read the U.S. dollar was once the strongest monetary unit in the world when tied to gold. And then because of political hubris, it was severed from gold and then weaponized against our enemies, against it to to harm enemies and to help friends. The U.S. has completely turned the dollar into a political tool. And so it, it makes a lot of sense to me that, for example, countries like Russia, Turkey, the BRICS countries are looking for alternatives that can't be weaponized against them. You know, with uh, after the weaponization of the SWIFT system, kicking Russia out of international payment systems after the invasion of Ukraine, um, you know, countries are actively looking, seeking alternatives. And so you've been hearing more and more about uh, potential BRICS currency uh, backed in gold. Um, you know, you've been hearing uh, Zimbabwe that established uh, they, there was talk about them establishing and I believe have taken steps towards uh, establishing a, a gold backed currency. Um, so and I think more and more you're going to see this as confidence in the dollar continues to drop as countries have been watching from afar the United States help their friends and hurt their enemies by use and by weaponization of the global reserve currency. And now they're saying, hey, wait a second. This doesn't make sense. It doesn't as as a question of game theory, as a question of like just uh, just geopolitical, um, just general thought process. It doesn't make sense to have one party that can put their finger on the scale the way the United States can, especially when they've shown their propensity and their willingness to do this so often. So countries themselves are seeking these alternatives. Now, a, a point on that, I don't think we'll necessarily get there. Um, the The reality is that establishing a, a, a gold-backed currency, establishing a gold standard is relatively easy to do. Maintaining it, however, requires extreme fiscal discipline. It requires extremely low time preference. And those two things are not strong suits for today's modern politicians, domestic or abroad. So establishing a gold-backed currency and or doing this thing in Zimbabwe, you know, they had that uh, ZIG currency, um, where it was supposedly backed by several tons of gold that are held in a vault. You know, earlier this week, it just came out that uh, that system now has been debased, that they're actively uh, debasing now that to give themselves more flexibility in credit markets, I believe was the uh, the stated reason. But, you know, uh, the, the de-dollarization trend makes a lot of sense. And, you know, so we're talking about it kind of in a, in a very macro sort of view, but 
ultimately de-dollarization, that process, that's exactly what's happening on the individual and state level too, right? People being able to and people actively buying more gold and silver is individuals readopting their own gold standard. It's them getting on their own personal gold standard. States, for example, this year in Utah, uh, we worked to help pass a bill that um, approved a $180 million investment of physical gold for the state of Utah. Um, and it also called for a study. I'm going to read to you the language of the bill. The bill said that um, the state treasurer shall conduct a study analyzing the role of precious metals in augmenting, stabilizing, and ensuring the economic security and prosperity of the state, the families and residents of the state, and the business in, and the businesses in the state. And this is a report that's due in October. So we actually, today is the 1st of October. This month, we'll have the findings of this report that the legislature called the state, uh, the, st the state legislature of Utah called the state treasurer to, um, to put together. So it's not just that other countries are de-dollarizing. Internally, states and individuals are seeing, wait, maybe we need to hedge against the US dollar. Maybe in the case of states, you know, maybe owning hundreds of millions of billions of dollars in CDs and in mutual funds and in third world debt, while not owning a single own, a single ounce of gold and silver, start, state legislatures and state financiers are starting to wake up to, to the risks of this, the huge counterparty risks, the huge risk of principle, the huge risk of you know calamity, economic collapse. And gold and silver are, are a hedge against this, it's insurance against this. But because the modern financier, the modern uh, broker, the modern, uh, you know, these are these are just euphemisms for people chasing returns. This is what the entire industry is. It's you simply chase returns. And so long as we're in an inflationary environment, that number will keep going up and you can keep promising your seven, eight, nine, ten percent returns or whatever. But when that number stops, you can no longer promise this. And so it would be a good idea to play some defense and make sure that you have the fire extinguisher, the 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 counterparty hedge, um, the counterparty risk hedge in gold and silver held in your state coffers or held in your personal vault in your home or held in a central bank. If in the case of, you know, international countries. Hey guys, quick pause. I won't take too much of your time, but if you're looking to add into your gold and silver stack, please consider Miles Franklin. More specifically, email them, info at milesfranklin.com, and tell them that Capital Cosm sent you in the subject line to unlock special pricing that you won't find on the website. In the unlikely event that you don't like the prices, you could always not buy. There's no commitment necessary, but I do recommend Miles Franklin for a number of reasons. The customer support is top notch, the prices are great, and I know the people there. Great people all around. So with all that said, let's get back to the video. Thanks, guys. So uh, I'm assuming you you own a few you know some some gold and silver, uh, JP. Do you ever plan on selling your gold and silver at some point? Yeah, I think it makes sense to um, as as a question of investment. Yeah, I think uh, in the case of you know we've been seeing in the last two to three weeks huge movements in the price of gold, um, and so to take off to take something out of the table, to take some profits here, especially, you know, in the case of people who have been steadfast in the belief of sound money since the seventies and believe that ultimately gold and silver will keep going up and have been holding since, you know, gold was uh, $40 an ounce. If that's the case. Yeah. I don't, I don't think there's any, uh, I personally don't have any moral qualms with um, exchanging your gold for fiat, uh, exchanging some of your gold for fiat, because that's ultimately what you're doing. You're, you are exchanging a deflationary asset for an inflationary asset. So as, as a question of investing, uh, as a whole, probably not wise. But the reality is that today, people use US dollars, they use Federal Reserve notes. Um, and there are ways that you can, for example, not spend the gold and still um, still tap into the liquidity. So for example, um, Money Metals Exchange, who is the, the, the owner of the Sound Money Defense League, they, the primary funder of this project, have a program that allow you to collateralize gold. So in the case of you not wanting to sell the gold, you know, because of what you're saying, you know, why would you ever sell a fire extinguisher? If the point is as insurance, why would you sell it? Um, and I think that's an extremely compelling point. 
But if you have liquidity locked into the assets that you can't tap into and you don't want to actually sell the underlying asset, there are programs out there that you know you pledge your gold as collateral and you're able to, to take out a loan against it. Um, so there are there are ways around being or having to sell your metals in the case of you ever wanting gold and silver, or rather, rather excuse me, in the case of you ever wanting to exchange them for fiat. And like I mentioned, the trend is that gold and silver are going to keep going up. Gold and silver have been money for thousands of years now. If you buried me today with a, a, a one ounce coin, one ounce gold coin in my pocket and a hundred dollar bill in my pocket and dug me up a hundred years from now, I can guarantee you that one of these assets for sure will still have value. I can't guarantee you that the dollar will. So it, it makes a lot of sense, I think, to to to. to to keep that in mind, to bear that in mind, especially if you're thinking about the future in the case of your progeny, your your offspring, um, you know, to to what what in economics or in Austrian economics is referred to as low time preference, mm. to to push consumption further out into the future and invest and save or rather and save today, pushing future consumption out, and that way, when the time is when the time comes to spend. You're in a good place for it. You've got the savings for it, and you can make good decisions without having the pressure of needing to spend money today. Right, and, and so this was a question from uh, one of the folks on on my Substack. Uh, he wanted to know his name is Awakening. Uh, he wanted to know, you know, what is kind of like your sell strategy when it comes to to, to precious metals or any investment. How, how do you? You know, there's plenty of talks out there. There's plenty of information out there in terms of how to buy, cost average, blah blah blah, mm -hmm. but. On the sell side, what do you? How do you personally uh, tackle that? I think some of it is well. I think it depends on what your holdings are, right? If you if you don't have a stack, I, so I would encourage you to have a stack first, right? A stack that you probably don't touch before you think about maybe trading like that. But when I get into trading, honestly, I'm I'm looking at charts. I'm looking at movements. Uh, so, for example, like we mentioned, we saw a lot in gold these last couple of weeks. And in the last two days now, we've seen a pullback. Uh, I know some people on Monday who took some off the table, who who exchanged some of their gold at you know almost 2,700 um, in exchange for fiat when they felt the pullback coming. Silver, on the other hand, is a completely other beast. You know, the, the gold to silver ratio is now widening. Um, so it, there's a lot of room for silver to run. I think I've seen the technical analysis say that if we can get to 3250 as a floor, from there you can springboard. You're up, you're looking at $40 an ounce, you're looking at $50 an ounce. From there, the, the limitations are endless, in part because of silver's capacity as an industry metal, right? So long as American and global policy is going to be forced electrification, you know, those the the silvers, the byproducts, and even like the lithiums and stuff. All of those are going to have a lot of upside. So if you're if you're playing upside, I'm I've been holding on to silver. The last time I sold was probably around sixteen, seventeen dollars, um, and so I'm I'm holding for this upside because I because of what we're talking about here. Because if you believe that the the printer will keep printing, if you believe that U.S. foreign policy will continue growing, that the empire that Leviathan will continue spreading. And all of that will require increased rates of funding. Um, if that's the belief, if that's the starting point, then gold and silver are a sure bet. Sound money is a sure bet because it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And so long as people stop or so long as people continue using the dollar and so long as the dollar continues to be weaponized by you know, our political betters, uh, this nightmare will continue where people are completely crushed under questions of affordability uh, and where horrid things are being done internationally in our names um, it, to, to benefit the empire or its proxies. Gotcha. Well, uh, I've got to thank you again for coming on, JP. This has been a thrilling discussion. Uh, we'll have the links to all of your stuff down below. And guys, if you enjoyed this content, got value out of it, be sure to give us a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. If you want more of this content, uh, you can find an exclusive section of this interview on Substack. So be sure to click the link down below for more of that con for more of this content, as well as a bunch of other of other perks that you can find outlined in the Substack link down below. And with all that said, you guys, thank you so much for watching. I appreciate your time, and I'll catch you in the next episode. Bye, y'all. I'm not expecting the printing to stop, um, which I think is a big part of why. Um, it's the the moribund dollar is demise is clear, you know, and I think that ultimately it's going to be a hyperinflationary event. 
Um, I'm, I'm not 100% sure on that, but I think that that uh, argument makes sense to me. It's a trend we've seen historically, you know, we, when we're looking through the, the hyperinflation of notes that have happened throughout history, we're following, we're following in these same paths. 